will simply sit and swell a little bit. So we've elevated the soft tissues up to here. And now with some form of elevator, I don't know whether we have a Joseph elevator here or not. It's not critical. I'll show you with a little two millimeter osteotome and the Joseph has suddenly appeared. Thank you, Rob. Um, it is next necessary to come up here and palpate the nasal bone. Palpate the caudal portion of the nasal bone and you will feel the instrument fall off the bone onto the upper lateral. This very important uh, relationship here should not be disturbed. Once we feel that little drop off, then we put the instrument about two millimeters above that simply get beneath periosteum with a little wiggling motion and elevate periosteum up to sufficient cephalic region where we want the hump to come off. So this is done here. We come to the opposite side, do it on this side, and that gives you a periosteal soft tissue elevation here on either side, which is attached in the midline to the sulcus and suture line there. So it would look on lateral view very much like this. You feel the nasal bone, you fall off, and then you insinuate beneath the periosteum and elevate it to here. We then, because we have two flaps, we generally take a Metzenbaum scissor or something similar and come up in the midline and simply bring those two flaps into continuity. So you now have the overlying canopy of the skin all developed and elevated. There is generally no value and no virtue in elevating this skin flap lower than sufficiently enough to get the hump off. In the elderly, we do tend to elevate a little further because the skin has lost its elasticity. But most of the time, next slide, once we have elevated with the scissor, it is only enough to gain access to the nasal hump comfortably. And we want all of the rest of the soft tissue here, and particularly the periosteum, to be left intact. So the nasal canopy is elevated about to here on this specimen just enough to gain access to the bony hump. Next, please. I then like to accomplish uh, uh, profile alignment by removing the hump most of the time as an on-block specimen. I think it gives you a little better smoothing of the profile. It eliminates some errors when you do the cartilaginous hump first and then the bony hump, and we do it in this manner. The 15 blade, once again, through an endonasal approach, comes into the whatever incision you've made and palpates the caudal edge of the bony margin. At the osseocartilaginous junction then, we create a parallel alignment with the blade and the cartilaginous profile. And just at the rhinion, we determining how much hump we want to use, we come through the cartilage, as you see here, and then dissect sharply retrograde, as you see on the slide, the cartilaginous profile down to and around the anterior septal angle. Now a tendency of beginners in rhinoplasty and a tendency that I have to avoid creating myself is for this little instrument as it comes caudal to lift up and leave an anterior septal angle too high. You want to avoid against that. Once we have created that little incision, that gives us now what is called a little fish mouth or mortise joint here. I think you can see it on the slide. And prepares us now easily for removal of the bony hump or profile alignment with a Reuben osteotome. I prefer the Reuben osteotome that has the vertical fin on it. I prefer those that have a rounded edge without sharp edges. And next slide. On every case, we take just a moment, it takes 10 seconds, to sharpen the edge of this little osteotome so that it is razor sharp. If it is blunt, it will tend to shatter. If it is sharp, it will cut precisely. And so, um, Dr. McLaughlin, if I could ask you in couplets now, staying out of the camera view, next slide, to tap, 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 tap. And very often I will angle the osteotome one side to the other 
simply to give a little bit more refinement. Tap, 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 good, tap, 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 tap. Now, if you'll stop just a moment, a tendency in taking off the bony hump is at this point to allow the osteotome to raise up a little bit, leaving you with a residual little excrescence of bone here that may not show up initially, but shows up, I guarantee you, uh, months and years later. So it's important to create an angulation here that does not allow one to come up and leave a little fragment of bone. Now you can be generous, tap, 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 good. Now you hear the difference in the sound, and at this point now, we have come to the root of the nose, and the bony hump now comes off on block. Now is a very good time to inspect that bony hump, both on its interior surface and on its lateral surface. It is an on-block specimen. This happens to be fairly symmetric. It certainly is easier in the cadaver. If you inspect it and find that there is a little more upper lateral taken on one side than the other, then that's a nice clue that you need to go back and trim a little bit. Um, this is very nice graft as well, and you don't want to discard this. This can be used in a number of places in the nose. Now, that leaves us basically with an open roof, and I think you can see on this specimen very clearly the open roof phenomenon as we have taken the nasal bones away from the specimen and created now a very broad, flat, open roof. Something now needs to be done to, uh, to change that, and that something is to create osteotomies, both medial oblique and curved low lateral osteotomies, in order to bring the lateral lamina of the sidewalls internal. Notice that the upper lateral is still very nicely attached to the nasal bone, and the bones are flaring out now, and we see the open roof very nicely. I'll show you here as well, something that's also been demonstrated. If the mid vault is extremely narrow and needs to be widened slightly, the upper lateral here can be dissected down slightly from below and spreader grafts placed through an endonasal approach very nicely in here. Now, next slide, please. I think it is uh, valuable on most specimens that have large bones and most patients who have large bones to establish the exact line of the weak point of the osteotomy by creating a medial oblique osteotomy that uh, traverses perhaps uh, four to five millimeters and is angled at about 15 to 20 degrees from midline. Dr. McLaughlin, if you will do that for me. This little osteotome comes in through your endonasal incision and is seated as you see here. We will do it this way for a reference. Tap, 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 good. Now, that begins to set an exact point of eventual fracture. When we do the low curve lateral osteotomies, either one or two of them, I don't want the bone to fracture down here and create a step deformity. I would rather rely on doing a medial oblique osteotomy so that I can establish and control where this final osteotomy is. It's like controlling the golf shot. You want to be in control of what happens when you hit the ball. So we've done a medial oblique here. We will do a medial oblique on the other side. And then, while the bones are still stable, the nasal bones are very stable. They're not weakened in any way. At this point in time, if there is need to accomplish rasping, we will do that. Could I have the next slide, please? And somewhere here we had a rasp. Here it is. The, the rasp is a very traumatic and dangerous instrument. Almost all rasps are too long. They don't need to be this long. They only need to be half this long. And the problem is that when you go up in here and you begin to do this business, you are damaging the glabella, you're damaging soft tissue, you're damaging the ala. And it is possible to accidentally catch, to catch the edge of the upper lateral and avulse it. So if we use the rasp, we do not use it in strokes like this. We use it in controlled pulling strokes that only traverse about four to five millimeters. So as the assistant stabilizes the head, 
through the incision and rasping obliquely, we catch the edge of the nasal bone with a very sharp rasp and just with strokes as you see here. It's very much like working with a curette in the ear canal. Not this, but slow and meaningful strokes with pressure that will allow you to soften the nasal bones. If there is very little to be taken out, then we will use the powered rhinoplasty burr instrument that we developed with uh, Zomed Company, and it is very nice as well for coming up and taking down little areas of bone. Next slide, please. Now, the sight and the attitude um, of the low curve lateral osteotomy is, I think, important. If it is made too high, you get a step deformity and you can palpate and see ridging. If it's made too low, you get no effect. So there needs to be a happy medium where all of this can be accomplished. Notice the piriform aperture right here. Piriform aperture is very thin. It's about a millimeter and a half in this specimen. And it is on the piriform aperture that we want to begin the low curve lateral osteotomy. We want to keep intact this little triangle of bone right here. Uh, I've never understood people who do osteotomies from external to the alar margin because they encounter this very thick bone. We want to begin reasonably high on that bone, come low, and then come back up high to encounter the medial oblique osteotomy, as you see in the illustration. Secondarily, I see no value in making an incision here. If you make an incision in the vestibular skin, there can be bleeding. If you simply seat the osteotome, and I'm going to show you how we do that, if you simply seat the osteotome on the piriform aperture right there and give one tap, that tap goes through the vestibular skin. It tends to crush the edges of it a little bit, and there is essentially no bleeding at all when you do that. We now want to go, as the diagram shows, next slide, please. We want to come low and then back up high to encounter the medial oblique osteotomy. All right, if you could tap, tap. And I'm going to show you this with a two millimeter osteotome and show you how easy it is. Tap, tap. Okay, come around here, Dan, or Rob, if you would. Why don't you come around here? You can see the osteotome now progressing. Now, the complaint that people have, tap, 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 tap. The complaint that people have is they say, gosh, the, the osteotome is too small and it will come off the bone laterally, or it will come off the bone medially. And that doesn't, doesn't occur on occasion. But if it does, now you don't have the resistance of bone. You simply stop, back up, and keep going. And I do not.